Hello there. Once again, this is Anton from Anton Old Bay. Thank you for stopping by the collection room, joining me this morning. Um, today I'm taking a look at the most common comic in the world, X-Men number one. Now, actually it's it's the first few issues of X-Men, but uh, the one that gets probably the most attention is is the very first issue of X-Men. Uh, it, it's just one of the most massively produced uh, comics in the world. I think, in my opinion, this was pretty much uh, Marvel's pinnacle, um, and probably comic books pinnacle in the in, you know in its history. You had some of the most well-known outfits, um, designs, and stuff working with your characters at the time, and you had you know you had Jim Lee drawing this stuff, and I mean it's there's a reason he was so popular. Let's look at it; it's amazing. But X-Men number one is is what is known as the most common comic in the world because uh, there was more printed of it than any other issue ever. There's more issues of X-Men number one than anything ever. I can't remember the exact number, but it's a lot. And um, came with a very bunch of various covers. And I think the cover I'm going to probably go with, um, this, is, this was the first one I ever attained. I actually like all the others much better. But... Uh, this, this is the, the first issue I had, and it has kind of a combination of all the other covers. Uh, most of the other covers. Come on, wait a minute. There's another one in here. Yeah. There's your Storm and Beast. So you had... <laughs> you had a huge cover. And this one just, re just put all the other covers in one. I, I like that. Uh, I personally probably like uh, just this one with the red background the most. But, you know, it is what it is. It's, this flipbook one was awesome because it also came with this backsided double poster. Which, if you've not seen, is an astounding poster featuring pretty much all the X-Men X characters ever. It was pretty awesome. I used to have one hanging on my wall. It was not from this. It was from something else. Uh, and it was only a two page, but it was pretty cool. And right away, you're gonna get like uh, like amazing stuff going on. Just in issue one, there's already a lot happening. Uh, this is in the middle of a different storyline. Um, and they do, this is the first issue where uh, X-Men branches off. And I guess, you know what, for reference, we really need to get like the date. All right, Chris Claremont, Jim Lee, what year? If I just try to go by memory, it'll be wrong. October 1991. Wowza. I mean, they knew that this was going to be a jump on point for a lot of new readers. So they they put everybody in. They're like, let's get this. this let's get it so everybody knows who everybody is, who everybody can follow along. Let's get everybody caught up on... Uh, What's going on with the X-Men? So it has tons of action from both of your your blue team and your gold team. And just a lot of, I don't know what you call it, character development that you need to know. You know, they just throw it all in here. And so it is easily one of the, I mean, the most jam-packed with characters, personality, everything. Uh, Stuff that maybe wouldn't have normally happened, like this Wolverine tagging, uh, bang Charlie, you're dead. You know, he probably wouldn't normally have done that, but this was a this was a book that I think was trying to get everybody on on board with who Wolverine is, plus his relationship with Cyclops. Um, they are buds; they were buds back then, and you know, there's just there's so much packed in this book. It is really, really packed in here. Um, because they, they had a lot to cover. They have a lot of ground to cover, a lot of people to cover. And they were in the middle of a pretty decent story arc that they needed to uh, catch everybody up on. And I'm pretty sure it's the Asteroid M uh, story. It has been a long time since I've read this. But it is, I'm, I'm surprised looking at it, just how much they're packing into just the book itself. I mean... Look at how many, I mean, there's a lot of panels going on here. And yet they're still vibrant, big, full-sized, a lot of stuff. And 
if you've noticed, like as I'm flipping through this, there's a lot of these panels that you've maybe seen on t-shirts, you've seen removed, pulled out, um, put other places, <clears throat> just because uh, there is so many iconic, not just covers, but panels from this comic. It's unreal just how, how big this book was. You can't really undersell it uh, because it was just so monumentally huge. Yeah, this this was was the pinnacle. Um, this started the, I don't know if it started it, but it, it definitely kicked the uh, the speculator buying into high gear. I mean that's that's a classic pose right there. Everybody had to have a copy of X Men One. And they gave you these villains galleries so you could kind of get an idea of who you might run into eventually in your X-Men comic. Uh, a little history lesson for those who are new to the books. Everything. I mean, how many of these pictures have you seen? Like different Cyclops been in the beach ball. I've seen that like how many times? Different places. Things to come. These are villains they haven't even introduced yet. So I've always kind of wondered this because uh, Omega Red is here in this promo poster, but he doesn't officially appear until issue four. So I'm like, is that his first appearance? Shouldn't this be his first appearance? I don't know. I just, I wasn't sure. Anyway, tons, tons packed into one comic book. Absolutely amazing thing. And then it just, it settles right down afterwards and you get into like issue two. And it's, it, this feels so much thinner. <clears throat> he's got the, I like how he's, I, I personally love this Magneto helmet where he's using the little antler thing. I mean, I like that. Still getting crazy, crazy dense, awesome panels like this. Full two-page spread for one big action scene. This is brilliant. That's one of Gambit's key poses. I mean, look at it. So, um, as many of you know, I, I sold most of my comics a long time ago, or this last year, through a divorce. Or, sorry, I guess it's been a couple years. I sold most of my books through a divorce. Uh, I did keep, however, I lost all my Uncanny X-Men, but I kept all of my uh, original X-Men 1 through 50. I kept the first 50 issues. So I thought that was pretty cool. I realized that just the other day. I was like, oh my gosh, I still have my X-Men 1 through 50. I had two sets of them. That's why. Is I kept an extra set for myself when I sold everything out. And I'm glad I did. This is This stuff is like so much the prime comics now I'm gonna I'm gonna probably ruffle feathers but uh, Chris Claremont is not my favorite X-Men writer by any means um, a lot of times I find his stories to be derivative of a story I've just heard in pop culture before um, you know uh, for instance I, he did like the whole brood thing and I was like yeah this feels a lot like alien and it came out right after alien and then some other stuff I've seen him borrow from heavily, uh, other stories, and I know he's just not my favorite guy. Some of his stories are a little convoluted too, but um, Jim Lee is probably, I mean, probably uh, up there in my favorite uh, artist of all time. And if some of you are looking at some of these panels thinking, gosh, that looks, lots of pouches and shoulders and everything, it almost looks uh, like young blood or image. Well, duh, because after he left X Men uh, and Marvel, Jim Lee went over and, and, and worked on those. He he developed a lot of comics for Image, took his creations with him, wrote them, drew them, and yeah. If you love Jim Lee's work, uh, check out mid nineties, uh, mid to late nineties Image, and you'll find plenty of it. But just seeing him draw X Men, I mean, it's a thing to behold. You can definitely see his style. I mean, it, it's got to be pretty pretty cool to be like 
the guy who drew and did the art for some of the most uh, most promoted X-Men stuff like in the world and to have drawn the most you know widely distributed comic in the world with the most number of issues published and sold that's probably to be it's got to be a thing tells you how much the world feels about his art style and how much everybody just loves it it also should be a good indicator of how much people love the x-men and they love them in this form the jim lee early 90s form this is why they put them at the cartoon show this way uh, they were all based on Jim Lee's designs, stuff like that. That's why, because it's simply the most, most iconic. It's the most aesthetically cool. It's the one everybody loves the most. So every time they revamp the X-Men and their style and everything like that, I just think, are you sure you want to do that? You know, maybe you should, you should look back and see kind of what it looked like when everybody else really, really loved it. And maybe take it from there. Base it off that. Or just go back to that. I mean, why else would... Uh, oh, like the, the early 90s cartoon characters of X-Men be still selling in Marvel Legends when they can't get their, their current designs to sell? Think about it. Don't be stupid. You know. This stuff was good. <laughs> it was very, very good. I'm going to set these back up here. So this is issue four. This is one of the more popular issues from this run uh, to get your hands on. I, I have multiple copies for some reason. I sold a lot of them. And I still have more. I don't know why I have so many copies of issue four because it's probably the most valuable of a lot of them. It's the first issue of Omega Red. Um, it's a pretty good story just in general. And of course, we're still dealing with Jim Lee. And it's awesome. Awesome, awesome, awesome. Oh, and you get... Uh, of course, why we all really love it, it's because you got uh, Gambit, Jubilee, Wolverine, and Rogue playing basketball, and we all love that. We always, for some reason, we, we just have to have the X-Men play sports. And uh, the Thanksgiving issue, oof, oof. Look at that. There's a Miss Glue in there or something. I think this one's ever been open. But, uh... The Thanksgiving issue, uh, Uncanny X-Men 308, where they play football. I love that one. Um, of course, there's another Uncanny where they all play baseball. Everybody loves it when the X-Men play baseball. Of course, Wolverine's always got to break their stuff. That's like a common thing. Look, he just hacked the basketball post because he's a jerk. Yeah. Ready when you are. Walden Books. That actually used to be a bookstore. <clears throat> it's gone now, but still. Um, <clears throat> I think Sean Cassidy, the Banshee, is in this, but right now he is... Vocal cords are not working. Got some great Gambit Rogue stuff going on. Wolverine still shoots the hoops. Wham, slam... So I, this rogue dress, I, I remember hating it when I was little. I hate it a lot less now. It's it's actually a pretty cool looking dress. So, and of course, I love pointing out East Coast Comics ads, Trenton, New Jersey. I absolutely loved this company. You could get so much stuff from them for, I mean, they would they would sell you comics through the mail for twenty five cents a piece. I mean, insane, insane stuff. I don't remember Banshee being a cop, but apparently he was at some point. I'm not sure who we're dealing with. I'm also not sure if you guys can hear the neighbor dog barking like an a-hole across the, the alley over there, but it is. Just hoping that it's not coming through in the video. Sometimes what sounds loud to me is not loud on the camera. And expressions. I always thought that was a pretty good name for for the, <laughs> the letter page. And I'm sad that there's like a stuck together page in this. That's, that's a bummer. Where was that? Oh, well, 
I'll find it later. It's not like I'm going to sell this one. I'm going to hold on to my X-Men 1 through 50 uh, just because. Anyway, uh, that is X-Men 1 through 4, Marvel Comics at their peak, all of comics at their peak. And I appreciate you guys watching. That's my story. Thank you very much. Bye.